want to welcome all of you today for attending uh, this session. My name is Ara Tapuzian. I'm the Executive Director of Michigan Venture Capital Association. And I welcome you to our first webinar, which is entitled, How Will COVID-19 Impact venture back startups. Uh, it goes without saying that we're living in some real unprecedented times. The pandemic is similar or arguably worse than any other global disaster we've experienced in the last 20 years. And as the world is changing on a daily basis, uh, amid coronavirus, with it comes a high level of uncertainty and fear. So today we've, we've put together this panel so that we can address the current crisis and how it will affect venture-backed startups and how, the, how to best weather the storm. So I'd like to introduce uh, all that is uh, on this panel. And uh, if you can't see their name on there, maybe they can raise their hand when they hear their name. But first, uh, just going alphabetically, Adrian Fortino is Managing Director at Mercury Fund. Um, they are an early stage VC firm focused on entrepreneurs and technology innovation. Based in Texas, but Adrian manages the uh, Mercury's Midwest office in Ann Arbor, Michigan, and also a current MVCA board member. Jan Garfinkel, who is the founder and managing partner of Arboretum Ventures. Jan founded Arboretum, a VC firm specializing in the healthcare sector, uh, also located in Ann Arbor, Michigan. She's also the current board chair of NVCA. Doug Neal. Managing Director, eLab Ventures, an early stage VC firm specializing in tech within the autonomous and connected vehicle sector with offices in Silicon Valley and in Michigan. Doug is also located in Ann Arbor and he happens to be our current treasurer on the MVCA board. Max Sneed, attorney with Kerr Russell Attorneys and Counselors. Max works out of the Kerr Russell's main office in Detroit focusing on uh, intellectual property protection, contract formation, negotiation, and entrepreneurial growth. Uh, Kerr Russell is one of MVCA's uh, newer service providers. Welcome, Max. And then Guy Turner. Guy is a partner and managing director of Hyde Park Venture Partners. They are also an early stage VC firm focused on high growth, mid-continent tech startups. Guy co-founded Hyde Park Venture Partners and he is with us from Chicago, Illinois. So panel, thank you for being here today. We've got a lot to really talk about and, and jump in. So for those viewing the today's webinar, you can submit questions via the chat room. I believe the entire panel can see those. We will try to get to those. Um, there are a lot of people that uh, are signing in to this. So I'm not sure if we'll be able to get to everybody, but we've really selected some questions that we think uh, will be on everybody's mind. And, and so with that, I'm gonna jump into the first question. And, and Jan, I'm gonna throw this to you because there's been a lot of talk uh, about the new stimulus package, the, the CARES Act uh, that was approved last night, I think by the Senate, and we're waiting for the House to hopefully approve that as well. Let's discuss this and maybe the implications uh, this has on the portfolio companies. Yes. Thank you and um, hi everybody and thanks for having me join you on the panel. Um, I hope everyone's staying healthy and strong and um, you know getting through this. We're all in this together so it, it is a very tough time. Um, with regards to the it's called the CARES Act that's what the stimulus package is actually called and um, relevant specifically to our portfolio companies um, the biggest, maybe I would say disappointment, quite honestly, is that there is a large part of this stimulus package, um, $350 billion, that's really dedicated to small companies. The issue is that there is language in the small business associations um, sort of here from a long time ago, 10 years ago, when we had the 2008-2009 um, collapse. Um, that essentially prohibits um, affiliates, this is a terminology that they're using specifically to the SBA language, affiliates that have more than 500 employees to be able to participate in a loan program that was being put, that will be put in place to help small businesses. So just digging in a little deeper, 
This loan would allow a company, um, and we were really hoping our portfolio companies would all be able to do this, to borrow up to $10 million to cover payroll, payroll taxes, rent, um, things like that. The issue is that the definition that the SBA is using for affiliates applies to, so for a venture fund, it applies to all of the employees of all of those portfolio companies under the umbrella of that one venture fund. So as an example, our Breedown Ventures, we're on our fifth fund. We have, I don't know, 25, 26 active companies right now. Right now we have 3,500 employees at the, that 25, those 25 companies. Because of that, any of our portfolio companies cannot qualify to apply for this loan. It is super unfortunate. Um, the NDCA has been working really hard to try and get that language changed. Um, as Ara mentioned, right now only the Senate has approved this. There is a belief that the House um, will approve this either later today or tomorrow, um, and they will do it without any revisions to what the Senate has offered up. And so there will be then an effort after it probably gets implemented tomorrow uh, it will take a while for the SBA to get organized to divvy out these $10 million loans. Um, we are going to see if we can't still impact how that gets um, you know, determined and if we can actually get the, the wording changed with regards to what an affiliate is. Um, there's actually an effort to even see if we could have venture-backed portfolio companies exempt from that requirement. So it's not dead in the water totally, but the way the bill will be passed most likely um, tomorrow will be that for, um, venture-backed companies cannot apply for the $10 million loan. Unless, I, I mean, the only thing I've thought about in talking to Justin Field, who's the NBCA uh, legal expert on this, is if you're a small enough venture fund and you don't have any other syndicate well, or limited syndicate partners, if you have less than 500 employees, you could potentially maybe still do it. But I think for the majority of venture funds and especially portfolio companies that are a little bit older that have multiple syndicate partners, um, it's, most, it's probably most like, unlikely that they'll be able to participate. Okay. Anyone else want to uh, chime in to, to comment on this at all? Doug? Hey, Jan, what's, what's your understanding of the um, personal guarantee situation? Has that been waived now? That, thank you for bringing that up, Guy. That has been waived. So um, uh, one of the things that NBCA was successful in getting changed was there was going to be a requirement for a personal guarantee of the CEO to um, basically backstop any loans that would happen. So um, that has been waived. So that is terrific. None of our management team members will be under that personal guarantee requirement. Um, we just really need to get this affiliate thing changed now in order to be able to participate in it. Ian, is there an ownership threshold for the VC firm to be counted as an affiliate? Affiliate. Not now. That's one other idea, Ara, that's being talked talked about. Um, that maybe there'd be a forty percent threshold or something like that. Um, but that has not. There's not one as it is established currently. It's really only Doug, this employee threshold. Doug, Adrian, do you have anything you wanted to add to this? Um, no, I think Jen covered uh, covered it really well. The only thing uh, I, I'm optimistic about that I read earlier, I think it's in the final language, is around uh, some of the um, uh, unemployment benefits for the gig economy workers. That actually looks like it could be a, a huge win for people who are participating in the gig economy. And I think gig economy opportunities are gonna be a um, significant uh, positive outcome of all this. And workers who can um, are displaced from the coronavirus can find opportunity in the gig economy will have better uh, benefits uh, on the other side of this. Is that something, Jen, that you know has, has been? Yes, so okay. thank you, Doug. That's a really good point too. So they were successful um, for an, an employee that gets laid off, obviously there's unemployment insurance. Getting really right down to the specifics in the language, they have added that if a, if a um, employee is furloughed, which essentially, you know, we the lawyer here maybe he can add some additional max can add some additional thoughts here my understanding is when a when an employee is furloughed they still get to keep their health insurance and benefits 
They just are no longer collecting salary. Um, but if that is the situation, then those employees can now also apply for unemployment insurance. So that actually is terrific because essentially they'll still get health care. They know they have a job once the company is able to rebound, but they will be able to go and get unemployment insurance and are not excluded from that in the new CARES package. Yeah, that's my understanding as well, is that they can uh, maintain their health insurance, which is really for a lot of them the most important thing, and then also collect the unemployment. Great. All right, let's pivot a little bit um, and really hey, talk right, about- Sorry, one, one yeah. quick thing. The, um, there's two things actually, I think that are of potential immediate uh, benefit, but, but I'd like uh, Max and Jan to opine on them. First is the employer tax deferral, which I think um, will be pretty relevant for companies. Uh, and the second has to do with um, the sick leave that came out of the bill a couple, two, three, four weeks ago. It feels like those two are, are pretty tactical and immediate and, and um, uh, audience would probably want to know about. Yeah, so specifically to the sick leave one. So this is the bill that was passed last week. Um, so they're, they're calling them phases. So they're calling the CARES Act um, phase three. The sick leave one was phase two. And I honestly don't even know what phase one was on that seems so long ago. Um, but on the sick leave, it, this really was actually well done. Um, if an employee gets sick and has to stay home because they have coronavirus, they will get two weeks of paid sick leave and the portfolio company can reduce their payroll tax at the next, you know, when they do the next run of their payroll, they just subtract however much payroll tax they had that would be equivalent to the total amount they're paying that employee for sick leave. So that is a terrific thing. Um, the new one uh, has something too, and I'm, Max, maybe you know more about it. I'm, I've been so focused on the affiliate, I kind of lost that one. No, actually, I'm, I'm not uh, not versed on, on the details of. Uh, of I'll look back through my notes here really quick. Um, and I, I believe I mean, NVCA has, a, I think, a pretty strong perspective on it. But my understanding, and of course, everyone should consult their accountants and their lawyers and so forth. Um, but my understanding is that it allows deferral of 2020 payroll taxes that an employer pays. I think it's only on, uh, I think it's um, federal employment tax, which is six or 7% or something like that, allows deferral where half is paid in 2021 and half is paid in 2020. I believe that's what's in the current bill. Um, suffice it to say that that's, you know, essentially it's six or 7% of payroll. Um, and would hypothetically increase the runway for companies by six or seven percent, which could be pretty meaningful. So something worth looking into. Thank you, Guy. Um, our, there was a question that came up too, I saw from Mike Therisakis. Um, yep. Maybe we should just address, um, actually it looks like there's a couple now. Um, do, yeah. Was this decision intentional in that senators thought that venture-backed firms may not need the support? It wasn't intentional, I don't think, on the part of the senators. I don't think anyone realized this um, legacy language with regards to SBA loans that um, has this affiliate language in there. I think it was unintentional on the senators' part. I think it is intentional on the SBA's part that they do think um, we um, have unlimited funds, being really honest, and that our portfolio companies don't need as much help from them because we have, you know, they think even though they don't, I mean, our funds are finite size that if you have a hundred million dollar fund, you only have a hundred million dollar fund. You don't, you can't make that bigger. So I think there is a misperception, honestly, on how the venture funds work, quite honestly. There was one other that question. one too while we're at it. Yeah. There's a couple Do you want more. to read it, all right? Yep, yeah. uh, we've got a question that says, is there a requirement not to have laid anyone off to take advantage of the loans. There, and you have to be really careful. I think there are some um, sort of if then kind of situations. So if you do lay somebody off, I don't know that you can take advantage of the loans. And this, um, I really do recommend that you speak with your attorneys and make sure they're really knowledgeable. This is, by the way, the CARES Act is 880 pages and it came out is it yesterday or today? I can't It just came out. So trying to get through 880 pages of a bill is a lot of work. And, you know, people really have to dig in to understand that. But there are, and I do, I think there are some other loan um, 
possibilities, but you have to be careful if you take advantage of one of those loans, then if we do ever get this affiliate issue rectified, then you cannot apply for the other loan. Uh, I, mean, I think we should recommend people, as Jan said, talk to their accountants and attorneys. I think michiganbusiness.org is a good website, michigan.gov, um, of course, national sites. But definitely be thoughtful about how you're dealing with any employee reduction so you can make sure they have maximum flexibility on benefits. Okay, let's, uh, let's pivot a little bit. Let's, because I think we could talk about this for a while, but let's talk about portfolio companies. And uh, you know, how are they doing? What kinds of conversations have you had with them? Adrian, I'm gonna start with you. Sure. Um, so this is, this is tough, a tough time for everybody, every uh, company, every employee. Um, the way that, that we've been kind of bucketing the conversations, at least in our world of, of um, uh, the tech side is, you know, you've got buckets of um, enterprise, companies and ones that are kind of smaller, you know, uh, more small kind of SaaS businesses. And, and the enterprise companies, they tend to have higher burn. Um, they uh, tend to al almost always have longer sales cycles and they require a kind of direct selling, almost in-person selling. And then you've got some of the SaaS companies that have lower uh, annual contract values, tend to have lower burn. They also tend to have uh, a, an inside sales model that is operating and has been operating. And so for that former group, that enterprise group, you know, those groups are definitely looking at um, this affecting them uh, more significantly than the group, uh, the latter group, the sort of, you know, more SaaS, uh, uh, shorter sales cycle, inside sales group. And so the enterprise groups are definitely making um, the, the the changes uh, uh, real time and are are beginning to uh, talk to their uh, uh, employee base about you know what that means and that runs the gamut. Um, whereas some of the the companies that have a lower burn uh, are are taking a little bit more of a wait and see uh, and see how things how significant this and how long they they think it may go. Um, and so there is a bit of a bifurcation of the way that, that we're seeing. And this is, this is not just our portfolio. I, I talked to um, people across the country, Guy and I have had conversations, Doug and I have conversations, and we're seeing this sort of trend happen right now. And I think that's generally fairly healthy, you know, and, and it really comes back to what's your net burn now um, and, and how, does, how do I, in, in, in the kind of whole scheme of things, how do I make sure that we have a runway that extends six to 12 months longer than what we had, you know, we kind of envisioned or planned for a month ago. Right. Um, and how do I get there? How do we get there as a management team? And, and we're going to go through, I think later about the, the tactics to get there. Uh, but um, kind of high level, that's, that's how we're kind of working through it with, um, with our portfolio. Guy, what are you what are you seeing on on your side? Yeah, it's I mean it's pretty similar to what Adrian described. Um, we have a we have a real range of companies in our portfolio, as as many of us do. Um, ours range from transactional businesses that are direct to consumer um, to enterprise software, uh, all the way to telemedicine. Suffice it to say that the only one for whom that there's a, a silver lining here is the telemedicine company. Um, but other than that, we've generally seen our companies considering, if not already implementing, um, somewhere between 15 and 45% austerity measures. Now those are done in different ways. Um, they are sometimes done with salary reductions, especially for companies who are more transactional and are likely to pop back up to prior levels fairly quickly once the economy opens up. For SaaS businesses um, that might be exposed directly to an industry that's gonna really hurt, say travel or hospitality or something like that, we think that while the inertia will slow down the loss, if this goes for a while, they could decline significantly in revenue and it'll take, it'll take a, lot of, a long time for them to rebuild. And so those are the ones where you might see um, uh, deeper, more permanent cuts uh, more of like a, a, a riff instead of a furlough or instead of a, 
a salary reduction. Um, that's, that's kind of the trend we're seeing, but it very much depends on the business. From, with respect to the wait and see approach, I think a lot of our companies were in wait and see mode two weeks ago, and um, we have encouraged them, and certainly the more experienced execs in our portfolio have um, gotten more aggressive over the last week or 10 days, really over the last few days, as, the, as they've realized this is likely to be pretty protracted. Of course, none of this is easy. This is really tough for our companies. It's really tough for the employees, and it's um, you know, not something we'd like to see, but of course, uh, you know, we, we want these companies to survive so that most of the jobs can be maintained, um, even if it's at the sake of a few of them. Yeah. Michael, how about your portfolio companies? You can hear me. Like, what about your, your companies? Oh, sorry, your audio, are, uh, was anybody else hear that? It sounded a little off. Um, I think you were asking about uh, eLabs companies? Uh, yeah. Uh, yes. Okay, yeah, yeah. So, um, Consistent with uh, what Adrian and Guy have said. Um, so I think we bifurcated also among another dimension, which is uh, is the company, because we invest a lot earlier stage, seed stage companies that are working to find product market fit and then are eventually trying to raise their A and grow. And the companies that are still trying to find product market fit, um, their, uh, their cost cutting, we're encouraging to be more significant because there's a lot more unknowns those with product market fit that are generating revenue and building traction, definitely encouraging some austerity measures there. Um, we think it'll be easier for them to find um, funding, even though it may be discounted uh, valuations than the first set. So I think that's uh, another dimension. And I also want to uh, feedback on something Guy said. Uh, the CEOs, we're encouraging and reaching out to our CEOs uh, twice a week, sometimes maybe a week to make sure we're there, we're there to help. Uh, if they want to talk, if they want advice, they want to um, we share with them best practice information. They're all under significant stress, right? I mean, this is building a startup and running a company is hard in normal times, right? Now it's extremely difficult and the stress on these CEOs is through the roof. So we're encouraging everybody to reach out to their portfolio companies and just one, be there, uh, but two, then offer the advice that you're hearing today. You, you touched on something that I wanted to ask everybody too, is really how often are you checking in with, with your companies? Are you doing it? Uh, you know, everything seems to be changing on a daily basis. How often are you checking in with these companies? Hey, Jan, how about you? Uh, your audio is getting really garbled. I'm not sure why that is, but um, maybe, sure. yeah. Um, here, how often are we talking with our portfolio companies, I think was the question. Um, so I think similar to what is mine garbled too. Maybe okay. something. Um, um, similar to what everyone else has said. I mean, we are checking in all the time. I mean, I think this week I've had a board call with four of my six companies, and we're doing that on a weekly basis. And then offline from that, I'm trying to speak with our CEOs, you know, at least once a week. Um, we are doing, you know, we do healthcare companies, and um, I mean, it is. What is going on in the rest of the world is also happening in healthcare in that, you know, all elective procedures have been stopped. Everything is directed towards COVID right now. Um, it is a, you know, really difficult time, as Doug said, and it is, um, we've asked all of our portfolio companies to do sort of scenario planning in sort of three ways. One is, what does this look like if the COVID is only three months? What if it's six months and what if it's a year? and really trying to think about different milestones that we wanna hit and different decision points that we wanna be kind of triggered into that we know we need to go from, let's say the three month option to the 12 month option. Um, it's, it's super hard because you're burning money every month and so you can't let these decisions take too long. So I, I have found it really helpful um, for our um, senior leaders to be thinking about what are those key dates relative to the milestones that we need to be making these really hard decisions and really keen in on that. So, um, you know, we're, we're trying to be as helpful as we possibly can. We're sharing all this MVCA information with our portfolio companies, um, you know, trying to find other alternatives. I think fundraising is going to be super hard over the next six months. I mean, we can't travel to go do a site visit, you know, we, I mean, it's, we can, 
We can do some diligence with calls and things like that, but you can't go see the team and meet with the team and, and really do all of those things. So I think fundraising is going to be really hard for all these companies. So the cash they have on hand now and whatever bridge the insiders are willing to do is going to be the money that the companies have to survive on. And that's what, you know, you got to figure out what value inflection points you can get to with that combination. So just to follow on that, you know, we, we think that this is going to be a six month or longer sort of, you know, effective economic freeze. And that's kind of what we're advocating to the, um, to the companies to be thinking about um, talking to a lot of people around the country. I think there, there, there are still a lot that think that it's going to be a little bit more short term and, and we, we definitely don't. Um, hence the kind of push to, to trying to get out to six to hopefully 12 months of um, extension to the, to the runway. Um, I think it'd be great if it could be two or three months, but um, man, does it do, doesn't feel like it with kind of where, you know, testing is right now. Excellent. How about you? You're uh, you get kind of a different view of this. Can you guys hear me okay? Or is it still garbled? Still bad? Yeah. Good. Yeah. You know, hey, Ara, maybe um, if you want to drop audio and pop back in, we'll we'll keep things going based on the Q and A that's come in. Does that work? Awesome. Um, I see a, a question came in. Uh, please provide thoughts on the impact how it's different by stage. So seed, Series A, B, growth. Uh, Doug, you want to take that one? Uh, yeah. Uh, um, I, I, so I think let's talk about it from a fundraising standpoint, then other people can jump in. Um, uh, cause I think Adrian already talked about the, um, enterprise consumer angle, um, you know, for series seed, again, everything's changing pretty fast, right? Daily. Um, we're a very different spot than we were two weeks ago. Um, and no one knows how long this is going to really continue, but, uh, some data we're seeing is that, um, series seed, uh, uh, stage funds are going to probably have to do a, a flat or a series seed extension with their next financing uh, if they're able to achieve that in the next six months. Whereas later stage A and maybe B uh, st stage companies are going to be taking a, a valuation discount. Um, now, you, you can argue that because the public markets had a 25% discount that the private markets should have that. I mean, I, I don't know if we know for sure that's the fair equivalency yet. Certainly you would imagine that um, the uh, venture community will take it, I won't say take advantage of, but use this opportunity to try to correct some of the overpricing that's probably happened in the market over the last year, especially in the tech and the AI space. It's certainly been uh, uh, super uh, turbo in the valuation. So I, I do expect a pricing correction for the, the A and the B and the growth and more of a flat for the Cs. But that said, just uh, the uh, things uh, I was talking to my partners about this earlier, it, it's not clear to me this is going to be the same as the other meltdowns. Um, from a broader economic standpoint, absolutely, it's worse than anything we've ever seen. But from a uh, venture and financing standpoint, I'm not sure it's going to be uh, as bad as the dot-com bust. Uh, back then, it was a very different world. We had unproven business models that were venture was way overexposed and throwing hundreds of millions of dollars at um, that we had never tried before. You know, web van right back then was a brand new concept and uh, it completely imploded. So now the companies that are executing don't have unproven business models to the same degree that we had at the dot com stage. So it's not clear to me that the implications from that will be as, a, you know, uh, in correlation with the size of the economic disruption. So I think it's to be determined. Jan, I think you guys are, of all of us, are the only ones that do consistently, they do some Series B investing. Um, do all, you, all, all, do all, all stages, them, yeah. Yeah, but, but we don't, none of us, none of the rest of us do any Bs really, right? So is there anything that you see on the, on the Series B entry point um, in, in your world that will be different? I think Doug is right that um, the later stages, the B's, the C's, the D's, I think there will be some course correction on valuations. Um, and um, I mean, we're actively looking at some later stage companies 
that are desperate to raise some capital. You know, again, these are healthcare companies. They were trying to sell into hospitals. Hospitals, they can't sell into hospitals. The so revenue's fallen away. Um, and so there's some opportunities where we could get in and really help them but it probably will be at a reset price because the revenues didn't ramp as what they expected. So um, I think there's actually some, if you have some fresh capital, it is actually a great time to really be investing, honestly, because I think there's some great companies out there that you could really help. And you know, your the venture dollars coming in can be extremely helpful to those companies and priced appropriately. Um, so, you know, I'm, we have a brand new fund. I'm, we're really pretty excited that we might be able to get some really great companies in over this, you know, once we get to the end of it and we know we really want, you know, we know we have the capital in our, I, honestly, one thing I'm a little worried about that we haven't really talked about, but um, the LPs um, with the credits, um, you know, they don't want to have to sell any of their public shares and take a huge loss. So, you know, can they get lines of cap capital lines in order to make all their capital calls? I'm just a little worried about what's going to happen on that side of the equation if we don't see the market bounce back up again. I don't know what it did today, but I know it had a good day yesterday and the day before. Um, so uh, I'm just a little worried about that and what happens if the LPs start having some liquidity issues. Check real quick. Is it any better? Or is it still better? <laughs> <No>. <laughs> Mara, what, what you might do is call in from your phone uh, right. instead of using computer audio. Yeah, turn so on maybe, computer um, audio though. Yeah. So um, Jan, if if we look at these two things, so you were just talking about funds. Actually, it's being being a really good time for funds to invest if they have dry powder. But on the other hand, we just told all of our companies to extend runway by 24 months. So, what, you know, what are, I think mostly it's entre or entrepreneurs on the call, what are they to think um, about these VCs who have all over their website and all over their Twitter, hey, we're still open for business, we're still open for business. Should people be spending time trying to raise money or should they, you know, uh, sort of interpret that as, as broad market? Um, I really think it depends on the stage of the fund that they're investing out of. I mentioned we have a new fund. So for us, we have fresh capital. We only have three companies in that portfolio right now. So, you know, we wanted to find 17 to 20. So um, we are actively looking. If it was a fund that is already, you know, up to, let's say they have 90% of the companies they're looking for, I would probably not try and talk with them because I think that's going to be a futile effort. They're going to save whatever reserves they have for their current companies that they have in that fund. So I think it's really important to find out how old the fund is and how many more companies they really want to do. Um, I think it's going to require a ton more patience on the side of the entrepreneurs. The, as I mentioned, you can't make site visits right now. I mean, one of our minimum requirements is you have to make a site visit to go see the company and make sure there's really a facility and, you know, meet the team and talk to the team in detail and, you know, all of those good things. So um, I think it's going to require patience, and I, I, I'm, I'm guessing a few term sheets will come to fruition where people will actually close on those term sheets, so term sheets over the next several months. But I think the majority of them will close after we know that everything is sort of lifted a little bit and we're sort of in the clear. Um, the macroeconomic world is just a little too frightening all the way around until we get a little bit more clarity on that to actually close on a lot of new deals. I agree, Jan. I completely agree. I think the, the thing that I would uh, say just to, to accentuate that, look, I don't believe that any net new relationships are going gonna, are gonna to create, you know, a term sheet. I think that within the next three to six months, while we're in the effective lockdown or close to it, um, if you're just getting to know somebody, it's uh, probably not worth your time as an entrepreneur. I think the only time that, that is worth you spending with a potential funder is if you've known and had an in-person uh, uh, conversation and, and have built a relationship with that investor before this crisis. If you haven't, I wouldn't waste the time. Yeah, and maybe to that point, we're actually looking at a deal right now where there's two, they're looking for, there's two syndicate partners already came together. They're both fantastic. We love them both. We'd love to do a deal with them. They just brought us a new company to look at. We don't know, the, and we don't know the CEO of the new company, but we know the space and we know these investors really well. So we will look at that because we really like these two syndicate partners.
Ari, now you're on mute. <laughs> I, I think your phone may be on mute. No, this is this is funny. Fortunately, Ari provided us some questions ahead of time. We can read off those. Yeah. 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 Sorry. No, we got you now. No, you're there. You oh, there? Yeah. Am I there? Yeah, yeah. All right. Sorry about that. Oh, that's I guess that'll be on a blue. That'll be on a blooper reel somewhere along the line. So we live and learn. Doug, you were you were still talking, so I'm going to give the floor back to you a little bit. No, you want you want it back to me. Let me Watch let me ask you this, and I'm okay. Um, trying to take care of all the technical difficulties and staying on top of all your questions at the same time has been a little bit interesting, but. Um, when do you think companies will become more aggressive again? What's your feeling on that? Doug, what do you think? Oh, sure. Um, well, it's a, it, it, it's a classic depends answer, right? It, it depends on a lot of yeah. things. Um, I think companies uh, have to be really, um, really focused right now, um, focus on their best employees, on, on you know, helping all their employees, right? But, but you got to keep your best employees. You got to, Focus on the markets that you think you can unlock faster. You got to be efficient with capital. You got to execute like you never executed before. So it's going to be lean for a while, and so you have to be on your best game. Um, now, the the benefit of, of of these down markets is you become really good, so that as things start to open up, you, you'll 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 have the opportunity to really accelerate your 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 plan. Um, you know, it, uh, I I had to. Uh, benefit of going through the dot-com bust as a CEO of a venture-backed startup and it was we were struggling to find product market fit um, and it was because of that uh, austerity measure that we actually got a very small team and we were able to figure it out and move through that and actually find product market fit and start to grow our company when we when it uh, when customer cycle sales cycles start to get shorter is when we start to notice things are starting to open up and become more aggressive. But you have to look at a bunch of your KPIs to know when things are getting better. Is the, is the investment market starting to get more relaxed and put, put more capital to work that you can deploy more resources, things like that. It's, it's going to be a big depends, but I guess I encourage the, the CEOs to really uh, sharpen all of their skills and have their team really sharpen their skills to focus and be ready for when those things do change. Great. Thanks, Doug. Hey, we've got a question um, that came in and, and maybe Max, you can sort of lead this off a little bit and then we can uh, go around. Uh, this attendee is asking, we have a set of definitive agreements that were signed and about to be exchanged by legal counsels when the buyer said that they need to delay given circumstances. And so this person is asking for suggestions. Yeah, that's a tough one. It's the, what's been keeping me busy for two weeks. Um, this has been happening a lot and uh, there's no blanket answer. It depends on why the specifics of why the, um, you know, one of the parties wants to, um, I guess uh, in this case, back out or, or delay. Um, most contracts uh, either have a force majeure clause or uh, if there is true impossibility, um, then just a legal doctrine can help, um, you know, perhaps delay, perhaps even uh, cancel the transaction. Um, really the question is going to be, is it impossible or is it just more difficult? The other thing that I'm not exactly clear on this circumstance is, is the question said the agreements were signed but about to be exchanged by legal counsel. If they were truly signed by the persons with authority, then uh, obviously harder to get out of. And if um, they're still in the negotiation phase between the legal counsel, well, then there's probably not a whole lot of obligation there and people are free to walk away. Um, but I think the main uh, question in these circumstances is, is it just more expensive or is it now impracticable? Is it now impossible? Uh, and if it is impracticable or impossible, then uh, chances are that a party would have a good argument to get out of the transaction altogether. Okay, very good. Thanks, Mick. So we've been talking a lot of defense here. Let's talk offense. Um, what can companies do to selectively be playing offense? 
um, once their foundation is, is solidified again. Who'd like to tackle that one? Guy. Yeah, that's an awesome question. And it's um, actually, there's an, a question from the audience came in that came in too from a pre-seed stage startup that basically says, hey, we actually don't have a product yet. Is there a product I should build to take advantage of this opportunity? Um, so I, I guess I would answer it sort of in two ways, which is, um, we're seeing a lot of uh, nimble moves happening in our portfolio. Um, and how nimble you can be is, is kind of a function of what industry you're in. So for example, if you're already selling into healthcare um, and you have relationships with hospitals, there may be specific modules that you can add. For example, several of our companies who sell into hospitals have added capabilities for messaging related to COVID. Um, one of our companies up front has done that to allow hospitals to communicate urgent messages on a personalized basis with their employees and with their customers. Another one, as I mentioned, is in telemedicine, and they added a module to treat COVID. Um, those are really specific ones in the healthcare space, but we have other examples as well. So um, we have a company called Talk um, that helps higher end restaurants uh, do ticketing and reservation services. They have never had an online ordering system. Uh, and within six days, they launched an online ordering system to allow high-end restaurants to do pickup and home delivery. These are like one-star, two-star, three-star Michelin restaurants that have never done delivery or anything before. And they got a product running in literally about six days. And it's actually driving a lot of revenue, both for the company and also for um, you know, the industry and, and the restaurants that they work with. So those are some real specific cases where you have companies that are already in the flow. They have customers, but the needs of their customers rapidly change. I think it's a tough time to launch solutions um, to a new customer base. So if you've never had a software that sells into hospitals before, you're not going to get a hospital on the phone. They've got much bigger problems. Um, the only exception might be, you know, maybe some sort of viral app on the consumer side. But I, if I had the idea, I wouldn't be on this call and I'd be launching it. Um, but uh, that's kind of how we're thinking about it. So if you have a fixed customer base whose needs have changed and you're very nimble, um, that's, uh, that's a problem to be solved. I think I would just add, well, like um, yep. I'm sorry, I would just add that, um, you know, each company is so different, whether they're pre-revenue versus post-revenue. Um, when you're pre-revenue, it's so much more sort of product and or in my case, clinical trial related. And so I just, it's super, super important for each company to identify the one or two value inflection points that they still can control and they can make happen and get those done and get them done as cost efficiently as you can. That's, it, it's, it's impossible to control this macro world right now. I mean, COVID has taken over, the economic collapse has happened, and um, there's, you know, a little portfolio company can't do anything about those things right now except take care of the employees, but they can control what the value inflection points are, how hard they work on it, you know, what employees are working on it, et cetera. And so that's really what we've really encouraged our teams to do is really find those, just the one or two things that you can still get done given the situation that we're all in right now and really focus on getting those done as well as possible. Because what you're trying to do really is set the company up so that it can be successful again once the air lifts and the balloon, you know, we can all rise up again. Um, you want to have everything sort of lined up to be able to go out and successfully fundraise at that point. So you have to have had that value inflection point occur during this um, quiet time, I'll call it. Yeah, and, I, and I'd underscore what Jan's saying there, that the, the CEOs take the opportunity if, if their board and current investors have not reached out to them, to go to them and say, I'd like to make sure we're clear on what the critical value inflection points are that we're going to create together so that if they are sources for your capital, that they're all on board. And they may be dealing with fires and they're distracted. So it's an opportunity to shine as a CEO, taking Jan's advice and being proactive with your board. We've even, um, at the comp committee level, changed bonuses to reflect, let's say, a six-month time period instead of a year because of that, to make everyone align for the next six months. This is all we're working on, and that's what the bonuses are based on. And that's been pretty helpful to really shed some focus. 
Yeah, I mean, we, we you know, we're B2B, B2B SaaS investors. And so the way that we've had the conversation to kind of orient, we kind of like, this is a customer success time. This is not so much a business development and sales time while we're in this kind of freeze. Like, what can we do to make sure to solidify the customers that, the customers that we have? They don't churn. Maybe there's even some expansion because they're in a, a market that is uh, growing in this crisis. Um, but just to have that uh, that sort of mindset in view. Great. Just a reminder to the attendees that we have, if you uh, submit something through the chat, we'll take a look at that. The entire panel can see that and, and we'll, uh, we'll address your questions accordingly. You know, I think a good follow-up to this is how do you, what are your recommendations for telling your portfolio companies or really all of these uh, entrepreneurs and how do they balance what's considered a higher priority? Um, maybe that was previously budgeted for and, and some reducing some costs so that they can kind of stay in the business. Who'd like to answer that? Nobody. Would that be somebody who wants to answer that? No? Can you just repeat it? I'm sorry, one more time. I'm sorry. I was reading the questions on the side. Sorry, I wasn't. Uh, what recommendations do you have regarding balancing high priority activities that were previously budgeted for and reducing expenditures? I mean, for us, it gets right back to what I just said, which is um, the budget, you know, as best as we all can, take the, let's say you have $10 million in the bank, how do you make that last 18 months instead of a year? And really figuring out what projects you can get done in that. There are gonna be some super hard decisions. There are gonna be things, you know, in a product that you really wanna have happen, but there's no way you can uh, you know, budget for it. because You gotta keep these companies alive. So some things are gonna have to go into, you know, the series B funding instead of the series A that we just raised. And you're gonna to have to table that product um, uh, gen that next second generation product to a later date. But the co if the company survives, you'll be able to do the second generation. If you try and cram it in right now and the company runs out of money and there's no way to fundraise, then we shut the company down. So it, it's hard decisions, but um, they're, they just have to be done. Otherwise the companies could go under. I mean, that's really what you're forfeiting. I, and I might expand on that a little bit. The, there, there's also this balance of if you have to, let's say, cut 45 or 50 percent of your cost structure, there's a there's a temptation initially to say, uh, well, I'll just cut 40 to 55 percent, you know, across every function. Let's keep it fair, quote unquote. Um, but there's really two frames that I think are more valuable ways to look at it. The first is um, where is the ROI right now? So there's not likely to be a ton of ROI in sales um, or customer service. That's someone that's for a transactional business, but there's a lot of ROI in customer success. So in a software business where you're, as Adrian said, where you're trying to maintain revenue, it's, it's hard to see how um, cutting people who take care of those customers and reach out to those customers is a good idea. And then the other, the other frame to think about is who are going to be the hardest employees to hire later? And to what extent will that slow you down? So I'll use the obvious example. It's been really hard to hire great data scientists, um, especially data scientists who are also developers over the last two, three, four, five years. So, you know, cutting those people is probably much riskier to your business in the long run, even if the exact work that they're doing, whether it's on Rev2 or a new module or whatever, may not be immediately needed. If you think it's gonna take six to 12 months to hire them later on, once you let them go, that may be a cost you kind of need to eat for now. Okay, great. We've got a couple questions here on the side. So let's get to one of these here. Got a question from an attendee that says, what are the specific market signals you are watching to determine if the funding window is open at a perhaps highly discounted rate versus a new normal versus historic benchmarks. Who'd like to tackle that? Start. I mean, initially, it's just some activity, right? Um, let's see, what this is, is something going to happen, right, while we're in the current bit of a freeze? 
Um, I think Jan Jan mentioned it earlier. Uh, I think I did too. Um, the there will be a, I'm sure a discount relative to what we've seen in the past. Um, but look, there are plenty of funds that are active with dry powder. Ours is, guys is, Jan's is, um, and so there are there are funds out there um, still looking for uh, new opportunities, but there are uh, fewer than there were a month ago, uh, certainly. So it's about making sure that you're spending the the time you have with the with the right fits. But for market signals, um, it's just a matter of you know when, within the next four to eight weeks, um, will we start to see some funding still happen? We're still seeing fundings coming coming through and it's getting announced right now. If you you know have the uh, the daily you know uh, uh, blogs that come through um, and. Um, but you know, uh, to Kurt's question of the the new normal, um, yeah, I think the new normal is certainly going to be one that um, discounted prices from from what we've seen in the past, sort of unquestionably. Okay. So we've got about a little bit less than ten minutes. So I'm going to ask the magic ball question. I mean, how long do you think this will last? What is what is your gut feeling for for those of you that have been through this and uh in in the past what's your thoughts on this who'd like to tackle who'd like to tackle that crystal ball answer first um doug i'll, I'll give it a i'll give it a shot um so and again as i said earlier that this is way larger meltdown than anything we've seen with the dot com the um, 9 11 2008 um it's way larger but again it's very different when the dot-com meltdown happened, seed stage companies needed a lot more money to, we didn't even have seed stage companies then, we had them series A back then, it was seed. Um, you needed like $5 million just to build your, your server room and your telcos, right? I mean, you had to build everything yourself. Um, we didn't have Zoom, we didn't have that kind of uh, capabilities, a very different world, different business models. Um, so I think, um, you know, the last two weeks have been really a major jolt to the venture community. We've, we're all doing triage with our portfolio companies. So we're all very distracted because of that. Um, you know, a few more weeks from now, things are going to start, I think, settling into a little bit of a new normal. Uh, deals are getting done, like Adrian said. We'll have more time, each of us, to spend time looking at new deals. The bar will be higher for sure, um, to, uh, but that's okay probably. And there'll be a little bit of a valuation depression. Um, and I think that will be the way it is through 2020. And uh, all CEOs should be reforecasting 2020 revenues, giving them a discount, make sure your board's on, on, on board with that. Um, and then I think through the you know, first half of 2021 before you start seeing a more return to normalcy. Um, now, during that time, I do expect there's gonna be some amazing new companies that we had never imagined before. And everybody on this call is gonna be looking for those. So uh, uh, I think that's, my prediction. Um, I'll go next. Anyone else? Uh, yeah. Yeah. I, you know, I think the, I think the virus itself, COVID, is going to continue. You know, we're only just now ramping up testing, quite honestly. And um, I, I sit on a hospital board, um, and it is, you know, we had a board call this week. It is crazy how scary it is. Um, but I think, you know, it's at least four to six more weeks of this, um, you know, stay at home, work from home. Um, the hospitals will continue to climb with regards to how many patients are going in there and especially the really sick patients. In a certain way, I wish we had all gotten immunity from each other earlier on and, you know, had, um, I don't know, I wish we had addressed it a little differently if we could have um, in hindsight. But anyway, um, so... I think the question is how soon do the travel ban and the freedom to travel and just get out into the community again lifts? That will be very, very helpful because the issue that we have right now is the demand side of you know restaurants and whatever bookstores and everything is just completely shut down. The only demand right now is for you know Whole Foods and Target basically and COVID tests and um, the protective masks for the you know, hospital employees. So. Um, that's the only demand there is right now. Um, so we need to see the demand starting to increase with, and, you know, and the freedom to be able to travel and go back to our normal things that we like to do. I think once that starts to happen and the consumer can get back engaged on the demand side, that will be super helpful. Um, 
for you know getting the small businesses up and going and hence all of our companies going again you know we're in healthcare so there'll probably be longer repercussions the hospitals are in horrible financial situation because they've lost all the revenue that they had 70% of their revenue was you know elective surgeries and stuff and that is gone and yet they're still being required to keep all these people to take care of patients and it's a really bad situation and there honestly needs to be a big bailout for the hospitals because they're not going to survive this if they don't get some federal dollars in a big way there's a little bit of money coming in the stimulus package but not nearly enough to help them survive um, so I think I think Doug's right. I think until probably, you know, we'll probably start. I think it'll start to lift a little in Q4 um, if we see another wave of the infection of the virus coming through. That will shut us down again. Quite honestly, potentially, um, you know, we can only hope a vaccine gets developed more quickly than a year or 18 months. Um, but I'm hoping that. You know, in 2021, our portfolio companies will be able to go out and successfully fundraise. That's what we're trying to plan for. Sorry, that was so long. <laughs> no, yeah, pretty, that's very good. Uh, Jane, there's. Uh, oh, go ahead. Sorry, Adrian. No, I, feel I was going to say, Jane, there's a follow up question maybe that you can help with. Uh, this attendee is asking about, you know, can innovation and healthcare get a chance to even be seen in this in this crisis what are your thoughts behind this i mean absolutely i mean well we have we're an investor in a diagnostic company that's making a covid test it's here in ann arbor called pneumotics it's fantastic um you know and they're they just can't sell their robots and tests fast enough because it's probably the best product on the market honestly for doing a covid test and getting a result in 80 minutes and they can do you know, 250 patients on one robot in one eight hour shift. I mean, it's just the fastest, most, it's the best. So some of the companies are gonna do phenomenal and pneumotics is, some are really gonna struggle because I think Guy mentioned, you can't sell into a hospital right now. They're just not doing anything but that and taking care of those COVID patients. So in selective situations, but I think, I think you know, creative entrepreneurs are just wonderful in really, stressful situations with coming up with really novel ideas and new ideas. So I think there will be a, a new generation of companies that comes out of this that'll be remarkable. And I think the diagnostic world, honestly, will get even more um, sort of credibility within the world of healthcare. A lot of people don't like to do diagnostics, but we love to. And uh, it's absolutely a critical part of the healthcare system that, you know, if we had had enough tests, early on, we would not be in this situation that we're in now. It's just ridiculous that we did not have the test ready to go. That's a good way to, to end that for sure. <laughs> we're gonna wrap this up a little bit, but I just wanted to make sure if there were any final thoughts uh, that folks had. Max, uh, you have any final thoughts to, to add to this discussion today? No, just uh, I, I agree with the panelists that uh, I'm, I think probably, um, you know, about the time school starts up in the fall is about the time I think um, normalcy will return. Uh, that's talking to my clients. Uh, entrepreneurs are kind of targeting, um, you know, late August, early September is the time that they are assuming uh, things will get back to normal. Um, I think that the predictions of Easter or just a few weeks are not realistic. Uh, and so that's, uh, that's my two cents. Adrian, what do you think? What are, what are your final thoughts? Uh, similar outlook to, to what Jan outlined, that things are going to be uh, pretty dark uh, until uh, the, the Q, well into Q4. Uh, and I, I think, you know, whatever the new normal is, as Kurt mentioned in this question, whatever that is, that won't really be here until 2021. Um, and, um, and I'm not sure what the new normal is going to be. Um, you know, honestly, but but at least I think we'll be out of, um, you know, the the situation that we're we're in by the end of the year. Uh, but we will have six very six to nine, probably closer to nine, very very tough months across the board, except for a few companies and industries. Um, and so we just need to prepare uh, for that. Guy, how about you, Guy? Nothing to add. Great insights already. All right. Doug? Um, yeah, I think my final thought is that I know 
this is a tough time. You know, we're, we're being pretty transparent with how dark we think it's going to be. But I do think it's worth remembering, you know, we are in the, in the uh, business of innovation, right? And there are going to be some amazing things that happen over the next 12 months. Um, changes to healthcare and tele telemedicine that were never possible. Uh, the gig economy where I talked about is going to explode. There are going to be things that we never thought were possible that people who needed to create a job because they lost one invented. And so I am optimistic. I try to focus on the fact that there's some really exciting things coming um, to help get through the kind of sequestration we're all dealing with right now. But it's fun to kind of look into everybody's living room as we get to do on Zoom every day and, uh, and, and chat with people. I just think keep communicating, keep talking to your CEOs, keep talking to your board, keep talking to your customers, uh, and just keep going. Uh, but it'll, it'll get better. Great. So what I'm hearing is that I may be stuck with my kids at home for longer than what I was planning on. And that's worst case scenario. Trust me. After we're done with this, I can untie them and they can run around the house again. <laughs> I'm just kidding. If child service is watching. Uh, Adrian, Jan, Guy, Doug, Max, I want to thank you for taking the time today to, uh, to talk uh, about what's going on in your worlds, your perceptions, um, and really sharing, you know, your expertise with the panel, uh, with the, with the attendees. So we, we had a pretty robust group and I could see now that they know that we're winding down. We're going to post this online for folks to be able to watch this. And so just to let everybody know that this webinar is the first of what will be ongoing efforts to communicate within the ecosystem here in Michigan. And we'll, provide not only, you know, updates with COVID-19, but really, you know, we'll touch on some other subjects as well. We do have another one uh, coming up on April 2nd. We're going to talk to the folks at the MEDC. For more information on Michigan Venture Capital Association, we ask you to visit us online at michiganvca.org. Of course, we're on all the social media channels. And with that, I just want to say everybody to stay well and Stay healthy. And again, panel, thank you for joining us today. Take care. Thanks, guys. Thank you. Stay healthy.